It's good to uh, be here, good to be back, to see uh, friendly faces and uh, camera lenses from all the major networks. Uh, it is uh, one of the challenges I've had coming out of, uh, of radiation is uh, I need lots of water, so apologies to those who are asking why is he drinking so much. It's just water and I need lots of it. So uh, I'm very pleased and proud of the throne speech that was delivered today by uh, Her Honor Lieutenant Governor, laying out not just uh, the year ahead, but a reminder to all of us of the extraordinary challenges that all of us have held together over the past number of years. It is unprecedented. I think I've said that word. I think a word search of how many times, as the Premier said, unprecedented would, would uh, bring back a very, very large number. But it does not change the fact that we've been able to be successful through COVID, through uh, heat domes, through atmospheric rivers, through fires and floods, because British Columbians are extraordinary at coming together to help each other. And the examples that we saw last year, I'm confident will take us through this year if we come upon similar challenges. But I'm hopeful that uh, the year of the tiger, 2022, will be a much better year and a more prosperous year for all of us, where we experience good health and our communities continue to grow and prosper. And with that, I'm sure there's a question or two, and we'll get right at it. Thanks. As a reminder, please press star one. to one question and one follow-up. We will start with phone and then come back to the room. First question today is from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Justine, are you there? No. Okay. We're moving on to Rob Shaw, Czech News. Hey, Premier. Um, I'm anticipating a response from the Liberals here, just based on reading your speech, that there's not much new in it. How would you respond to that criticism that there isn't a lot of new items uh, listed in your throne speech? Well, throne speeches uh, historically, and I've been here for many of them, uh, lay out uh, the plan for the government in the coming year. That roadmap is then uh, filled out by a budget that will be tabled in two weeks' time that will lay out where we plan to put uh, public monies to meet the needs and challenges of the 20, uh, uh, 2022. And I would also highlight that there were a number of initiatives that were uh, announced today, the uh, creation of a new uh, ministry to address lands, water, and natural resource stewardship, uh, a standalone forestry ministry. These are administrative organizational ideas, but they will have a profound impact on our economy, on our rural communities particularly, but right across the board, uh, doing a better job of rationalizing and streamlining processes is good for business, good for workers, good for communities, and good for the environment. It was a massive job over the past 12 months for uh, the professional public service to look at how they could reorganize themselves on the land base to ensure that we're getting best outcomes for people for uh, the, the land and for communities. And so I'm very happy to see that work uh, coming to a conclusion and the beginning of the work ahead for that ministry. We also talked about the economic plan that Minister Cowan will be tabling uh, next week and talked about the challenges that we face on in continuing to have the strongest economy in the country. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens by having investor confidence. It happens by having a skilled workforce. And it happens by making sure that government can be responsive to new ideas as they come forward. Uh, you heard in the throne speech discussions about agriculture and agri-tech that will transform our, our supply chains and make sure that we can do our level best in the years ahead to feed ourselves, taking advantage of the agricultural land reserve and the, and the far-sighted vision of those who came before us to protect that land, not for development, but for the creation of food. And we need to find new and innovative ways to create more food uh, for the people in British Columbia and other markets. I'm reminded of uh, how little uh, Netherlands produces uh, not just food for themselves, not just flowers for uh, the world, but uh, an extraordinary amount of food for their neighbors uh, on a small, small footprint. Here in British Columbia, we have, uh, uh, it became abundantly clear through the floods in the Fraser Valley and, and at Sumas Prairie particularly, that our agriculture sector is strong, it's resilient, but it needs to be there for the long term. Uh, I'm grateful that we were able to put uh, almost a quarter of a billion dollars into the ag uh, agricultural recovery programs coming from the floods. And there's much more to come in terms of our infrastructure, protecting those communities going forward, working with our federal partners. And that's just a bit of it. Uh, I think if you go back and read the speech, you'll find that there's a whole bunch of uh, information in there about how we're going to work together to build a stronger, better British Columbia. Rob, do you have a follow-up? 
Sure. Can I also ask you about uh, COVID restrictions? Saskatchewan today uh, announcing that they're getting rid of their mandatory vaccination uh, card system uh, as of Monday and ending indoor masks as of the end of the month. Alberta has a uh, a plan they're announcing in an hour or so. Uh, where is BC on moving up the end of these restrictions? What would you say to people who are looking at the other provinces and hoping that we're going to move that quickly as well? Well, I would I would suggest that uh, we're going to follow the same uh, path that we have been on uh, since the uh, the pandemic began, and that is to take advice and counsel from public health officials who are working with. Uh, our acute care system and working with others in the community to make sure that we're continuing to protect people and uh, restrictions, uh, d direction and advice on restrictions will come from the public health office and in the days ahead. She's uh, made it clear that she has plans uh, for uh, Family Day, which is coming. Uh, I will say that where we have had success is ensuring that workplaces have plans in place to protect workers and to protect customers and, and that should continue. Beyond the pandemic, uh, I believe that uh, masks are, are effective in protecting people, and I, I don't believe that uh, an arbitrary decision by an elected official is the best way forward in that regard. And similarly, uh, the immunization cards uh, supported uh, by the vast majority of people to ensure that the sacrifices that they've made have pr provided benefits for them and their families going forward. Uh, and we'll just see where Dr. Henry wants to go with all of this. Uh, she hasn't advised me on her plans yet. I have a vague idea based on uh, hospitalizations being stable, cases coming down. Uh, and with respect to other jurisdictions, everybody's addressed this in a different way. And I, again, I, I'll put our record up against all of the other provinces in the country. And uh, outcomes have been better in terms of uh, mortalities, in terms of uh, impacts on the economy. Clearly, our uh, unemployment rate is 5.1% uh, leading the country, are created more jobs than existed before the pandemic. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of positive to say about how we've got here. And it all is a result, not of uh, government policy. Specifically, it's about British Columbians rec recognizing and acknowledging that they have a role to play to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. And I don't believe that's going to change because of announcements in other provinces. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hi, Premier. Just following up on what Rob asked there, just wondering, uh, you said you have a big idea. Could it be, you think, weeks or months? And do you think that those other jurisdictions are bowing to perhaps political pressure? Because we have heard um, some uh, politicians there supporting the convoy in Ottawa. You've had a protest there um, outside the legislature today. So uh, just if you have a bit of a sense on sort of what that timeline could look like. Well, again, uh, Dr. Henry has made it clear in her briefings that she will have more to say uh, next week. Uh, so I'll leave it to her uh, to bring that forward. I wasn't um, trying to be uh, obtuse there with the question that came from uh, uh, Rob, uh, I, I, I understand uh, the, the work that the public health officials are doing with uh, Minister Dix and others to ensure that we're in sync with the public and the, and the virus, not in sync with uh, a handful of protesters. And having said that, uh, I do absolutely recognize the right of people to dissent uh, to public policy. Uh, I come from a party of dissent. I can't remember. I couldn't count the number of protests I've been to in my life starting in grade seven and uh, going up until uh, recently. Uh, but that does not, I don't recall at any time ever uh, trying to deny rights of other citizens. I, I don't recall at any time participating in anything that involved uh, threats and intimidation to other citizens. And, and I would hope, uh, and not, it's not just um, uh, the, uh, the convoy uh, movement or any other movement that seeks to put themselves ahead of the rest of British Columbians. That's just not on in a democracy. Uh, we uh, certainly welcome uh, those who want to exercise their right to dissent, but we do not, uh, and I don't believe the vast majority of British Columbians support uh, intruding into the lives of other people who are trying to get on with uh, a very challenging time. So I'm hopeful that people will continue to express their discontent in a way that does not interfere with the lives of other people. Do you have a follow-up, Binder? I do, and I'd like to ask you about FIFA. Um, a question from a colleague. Do you think Vancouver uh, stands a chance, and can you give us an update on sort of where those discussions may be at? Well, certainly, I'm happy to do that. Uh, we have uh, been approached by uh, Soccer Canada uh, and officials uh, by, by way of Soccer Canada through to FIFA uh, to revisit the uh, question of whether Vancouver could be a uh, host city for the uh, 2026 World Cup. 
Uh, when we made a decision in 2018, uh, we had just uh, formed a government that was a minority government. We had a list of priorities that we wanted to address. And uh, the FIFA request in 2018 for something eight years down the road did not seem urgent and pressing to, to me personally. And uh, I felt that uh, based on uh, our analysis of the requests from FIFA, that it was uh, too rich to have a blank check uh, without us having a full understanding of the challenges that we faced in a number of other areas. It's 2022. Uh, we have a, a strong majority government. We have uh, a need to attract people back to British Columbia for our tourism industry, for our hospitality sector. And the prospect of events, whether it be FIFA, whether it be the Invictus Games, which is very much in play as well uh, for British Columbia in the years ahead, and uh, the Indigenous-led uh, movement to see uh, the 2030 Olympic bid come back to Vancouver Whistler are all things that we're happy to entertain, provided we have a full understanding of what the cost will be, and we can transparently make that clear to the people who will end up having to pay for much of it. Uh, the citizens of British Columbia. Having said that, uh, obviously the, uh, the success of the Canada Canadian soccer team uh, preparing for Qatar in 2022 is exciting for soccer fans and Vancouver, British Columbia is filled with soccer fans and I know that the connections between Vancouver, Seattle and down the west coast is appealing to FIFA. So we're in, in discussion to see what we can do about finding an agreement that meets our needs and meets the needs of FIFA and does not upset arrangements with other cities uh, across North America. But it's something that I believe we would be remiss if we didn't uh, engage with uh, uh, representatives of Soccer Canada to see where there was space for us to find something successful for our, our tourism sector and for hospitality. We have uh, in BC Place a very expensive stadium that had a rebuild that was almost as expensive as the first construction and it's been virtually idle for the past two years. I don't think that's a, a cost-effective way to manage public resources. So if there's a way that we can see that facility used more, whether it be more concerts, more sporting events, uh, more other uh, convention-style activity, we want to see that happen. And so Melanie Mark, uh, the Minister responsible, has been working across the board to find ways to attract more people to British Columbia when it's safe to do so, so that we can restart those key parts of our economy. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Premier, one of the mentions in the throne speech is about how the end days of this pandemic will be in months and not years. I think we all anticipate that. How crucial is getting people back to work as part of driving the economy again, getting people back on transit, getting people uh, back using downtown restaurants and coffee shops? And what will the government do to help push that back? Will there be an encouragement at some point to get people back in their traditional workplaces? Well, certainly that's the objective, uh, not just for the government, but for businesses, for workers, for families. Uh, people want to put COVID behind them. I get that. Uh, uh, I'm at the front of that line uh, with Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. But we want to make sure that we don't uh, do it in a reckless and cavalier manner just because uh, people are honking horns. Uh, a small minority are, are honking horns. We want to make sure that the sacrifices that businesses and workers and communities have made over the past two years are, are not just uh, uh, thrown away uh, because of some noise uh, out on the, the le legislative lawn or in uh, the capital city of Canada. Having said that, I absolutely understand that people are done with this. I, I live in a community. I have neighbors. I, I talk to people all the time and we want to move on. They want to move on. We all want to move on. But uh, we have been successful by following uh, the guidelines and the hard work of public health officials uh, led by Dr. Henry and her team and making sure that we're supporting the acute care system that's so fundamental to the delivery of uh, emergency services to British Columbians. And as hospitalizations start to decline, we're in a better position to take po actions on um, restrictions that are in place and be more encouraging of uh, people to get back uh, in the game, uh, get, get out there. And uh, I was delighted to see uh, stakeholders in the education sector uh, agree to uh, renew tournaments for young people. Uh, I, I remember as a high school student how important that was to my development, not just uh, with respect to physical fitness, but socialization, 
uh, the notion of teamwork, working together, collective purpose, common goal. These are fundamental issues that are part and parcel of our K-12 system that have suffered because of COVID, and I'm grateful that that's starting to come back. And it's examples like that, I think, that people want to see, and they, they hold that up as some uh, symbol of hope that we are getting to the end of this. Follow up, Richard? How crucial are lift, lifting these capacity limits to help reinvigor the economy? And how crucial are, are moving beyond restrictions to drive the economic plan and the budget that will come out of this throne speech? Well, it's critically important. Uh, Minister Callan will have uh, much to say next week. And of course, Minister uh, Robinson even more the week after. Uh, we are uh, uh, looking again at one of the hottest economies in the country, but one of the biggest challenges, and that was highlighted by the labor force uh, data uh, last week, uh, a million jobs will go wanting in the next uh, 10 years if we don't uh, start a human resource strategy to meet those vacancies. And, and you've been covering, uh, you and others in this room and across the, uh, the press gallery and media have been covering the challenges that uh, employers are facing trying to find people to fill vacancies. And in areas where there is uncertainty, like hospitality, it's harder to encourage people to wait for their job to come back when other opportunities are presenting themselves because of a hot labor market. So uh, workers, working people, have uh, more options today than they did uh, five years ago, and that's putting a strain on existing industries. And they're looking not just to government, but to uh, the marketplace to find ways to meet their needs. And, and we need people back and moving around and exp spending their discretionary money on uh, a night out, uh, uh, gifts, uh, retail activity uh, that's not internet based, I would suggest. And if, uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Next question is from Lisa Yuzda, City News. Premier, you have throughout this let um, health take the lead, but we are seeing other premiers go more in front of, you know, the next steps in the pandemic. And I'm wondering when we will see that with you. And are you feeling pressure when you're seeing other provinces and other premiers, for lack of a better term, taking the lead with this? Not at all, because I talk to the premiers and I know the grief that that brings with it. So uh, and I, I don't I don't want to leave the impression that I'm passing the buck to Dr. Henry, but she is far more equipped and able to uh, understand the data and translate that for the public than I am. And I said to my colleagues two years ago that uh, if they felt that being the intermediary between the experts and the public was a good idea, that I thought they were wrong. And I continue to think that's the wrong approach. Having said that, uh, as you'll know, uh, I have been continuing to work not just on the pandemic issues, but uh, uh, working to try and get a renewed uh, interest from the federal government in the Canada Health Transfer, which sounds like an uh, administrative or, or, or accounting practice, but in fact, it's about the resources we need to hire the people to provide the services that will reduce wait times, that will get better outcomes for cancer care, uh, for a host of other things. So those are the areas where I believe I can be most valuable to use my experience and my persuasive abilities to move uh, issues along. I have had from the beginning an approach to cabinet government that I have very capable people around me that have more than enough experience and ability to do their work without me meddling in it. And it's just a, the approach that I've had from the beginning. And I don't see any reason to change that now. Uh, I, I have confidence in the people that are making these decisions. I have discussions. I disagree. And then we talk things through. And that's I believe a better way for me to use my abilities to meet the needs and expectations of British Columbians than to be standing here, quite frankly, every day, uh, trying to interpret uh, the issues that uh, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix know way better than I do. So why would I get in the way of that? As we move into reopening, uh, as that happens, I'll be standing with the Minister of Finance, I'll be standing with the Minister of Economic Recovery and, and other ministers uh, to work through these things. But it's my view, and, and I, I don't see any reason to change it, that I have capable people, British Columbians can have confidence in them, and uh, I'll do my best to support them whenever I can. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? And just regarding the months comment that's in the throne speech that, uh, you know, uh, taking care of people's health in the months ahead, you know, coming out of the pandemic, is that is that an actual or an aspirational look at what's coming ahead? And when you're talking about, you know, how your neighbors and so many people, well, how all of us are just sick of the pandemic, 
I'm wondering how, you know, when the winter comes again, and Dr. Henry's talked about that it's going to be, you know, essentially another brick in the head, how do you, how would you claw back and put in any restrictions again, you know, when people are in this place of being absolutely fed up? Well, again, uh, that's, that's up to the data. That's up to the information. Uh, and um, we're not going to stop monitoring and tracking this information uh, when we reduce the number of times we have uh, press availabilities. We're going to continue to do the work. And, and as the evidence presents itself, we'll lay it out for British Columbians and we'll have that discussion. But I, I don't, you know, I don't want to in, anyone to interpret the word in the months ahead as meaning we're months away. That's a, that's a statement that we have work to do. And, and it's not unlike uh, our response to uh, flood recovery, uh, the, the extraordinary challenges in Lytton. Uh, we have a ton of work from last year that we need to keep working on. And we, we don't know what the future holds, but we need to be prepared for any eventuality. And that's why we're working on a whole bunch of fronts. So when I say the months ahead, we're going to continue to have health challenges. We're going to continue to have environmental challenges. There are going to be uh, challenges for our economy uh, if we don't find a way to bring more skilled people and even unskilled people to play uh, in, in our economy. 5.1% unemployment uh, at a time when uh, other jurisdictions are seeing an increase in unemployment. This is uh, more people came to British Columbia in the first three quarters of last year than have done so since 1972. That's uh, international immigration as well as in migration. So people are coming to British Columbia and we need as a government to make sure that the services they need are there and that uh, they can contribute to, to the economy and be their best selves uh, as they put down roots here. Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Thank you, thank you, Premier. Um, in reading the throne speech, I'm looking at the big issues it points to on the on the topic of health, you're, lo you're looking for more federal government assistance there. On the opioid crisis, you're waiting for federal approvals on decriminalization and safe supply. On housing, you're waiting till the fall to introduce legislation. And same with emergency management to deal with crises. Um, what do you say to people who might look at this and, and think the document doesn't seem to, seem to lack urgency on the big issues? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd have to disagree. Uh, uh, big issues require big solutions that require consultation, require uh, fastidious work by content experts inside government and outside government. Uh, discussing how we manage emergencies. Uh, uh, we've had a couple of uh, classes in managing emergencies over the past number of years, and we've learned from that. And now we need to make sure that we can uh, implement what we've learned in legislation. We said last fall, that the Emergency uh, Act would be amended next fall, which is coming up. And so we're right on track for that. Uh, there are a range of issues you mentioned with respect to the uh, opioid crisis that need partnerships with the federal government. The criminal code is a federal responsibility, uh, making sure that we can implement our groundbreaking safe supply initiatives in a way that's coherent and meets the needs of uh, communities as well as uh, the line that would be drawn by a federal government requires collaboration. And, and I know that um, it's usually, and I, uh, as a student of history and someone who's been around here for a long, long time, it's usually a safe bet that provinces will bash the federal government. And I, I don't see any percentage in that. I see collaborating with the federal government where we need to. We are a, a federation, a decentralized federation that depends on orders of government doing the right thing. And when it comes to the Canada Health Transfer, that's long overdue. And to have the support of all of the other premiers uh, over the past number of years to work collaboratively to find a way to reimagine public health care is really important. Bringing the federal government along when it comes to the opioid crisis is really important. So I don't believe it's a, an abdication and a blame thing. It's about just reminding them that we have a joint responsibility on some of these issues and we're going to get better outcomes if we collaborate, which is again part and parcel, I believe, of the message of the throne speech. Collaborating with the opposition, uh, you'll remember the first few years of our government was a collaboration with the Green Party and some collaboration with the official opposition. There's a new leader of the official opposition. I'm hopeful that he will bring a collaborative tone, but I'm also um, savvy enough to know that there'll be a couple of bricks coming my way, and I'm fine with that too. But at the end of the day, we're all here for the same reason, to improve uh, outcomes for people, and that requires... Uh, more humility and less hubris. So uh, I'm going to let experts and people who are uh, efficiently bringing information to the public do their job, and I'll back them up when I need it. Lisa, do you have a follow-up?
Yes. So are you saying then that these are aspirational notions for you and not really promises to British Columbians that these things can be accomplished in this legislative sitting? Well, this is the second aspirational question. And I, every, every day is an aspirational day for me, uh, trying to make it better than it was the day before. So I'll concede that. But, but that's not a concession to no success or no progress. It, it means that in order for us to get to where we want to go, in order for us to get to the end of the road, we're going to need to do it with partners and allies and accomplices. And that includes communities, indigenous peoples, young people, workers, investors, other orders of government. And so uh, we need to address the health care crisis, which is, having seen it firsthand over the past number of months, uh, uh, incredibly compassionate and professional people that are just being strained beyond uh, the breaking point. They need to know that there's help on the way. Uh, and I, my job is to make sure that the federal government fully understands that they can't continue to talk about a national health care strategy if 80 percent of it's being paid by individual provinces, some with greater capacity than others. We need a national plan. I'm confident that we'll get there. The prime minister has been uh, uh, very forthcoming in our conversations as recently as, uh, as uh, uh, near Christmas. But of course, when he was here to uh, assist uh, putting together a, nas a, a national solution, to uh, the uh, atmospheric river and the impacts in the Fraser Valley and in Merritt and, and through the Coquihalla, it was an opportunity for us to again hammer home this fact that all Canadians need a, a vibrant British Columbia. All British Columbians need a vibrant Canada. I suppose that's aspirational, but we need to be working on it every day with a view to outcomes. And our outcomes are uh, making sure that we reestablish uh, our highway system, making sure that our ports are working and functioning for all Canadians and making sure that we can reduce wait times, hire more people, get more doctors and nurses, make sure we're caring for our elders in a, in a humane and thoughtful and compassionate way. All of that is on the agenda of the federal government. The trick now will be to get uh, the resources to deliver that in the hands of the people who do it, and that's provinces. Okay, we will come back to the room for questions. Andrew McLeod, Taiyi. Hello, well, Premier, good to see you. Um, in the speech, uh, it referred to healthcare funding, the healthcare funding model as being unsustainable. Uh, you're talking today about the, the stress the system's under. You used similar language last week. Uh, it's the kind of language that often gets used by people who want more private sector involvement in the, the system, uh, you know, who, who, who will propose you know, two-tier solutions, that kind of thing. Uh, are you worried at all about undermining the system by using language like that? No, no not at all. The system's undermined. Uh, Andrew, it, right now, it doesn't have uh, sufficient resources to meet the expectations of the public. Uh, and, and those expectations are real. It's about uh, knee and hip replacements. It's about diagnostics. It's about treatment for cancer. It's about a whole host of things that are, are being rationed because we don't have the resources. It's not about delivery of public or private. Every comment I've made, I, I'm confident that I've suggested that it's our public health care system that separates us from our other partners here in North America. And that is a right of citizenship, but we can't take it for granted. And the federal government has been taking it for granted to this point in time. Eight, nine percent increases in costs cannot be sustained. You see the, you've seen many, many budgets here. The health budget is growing at a rate that we can't support just with uh, tax revenues and, and other revenues here in British Columbia. The money that Ottawa would send much of it was generated here. That it's not, uh, Ottawa doesn't have a special place that it gets resources. It gets it from Canadians, including British Columbians. And we have been uh, willing partners in, uh, in uh, redistributing the wealth of British Columbia to other places, uh, and one of those places being the federal government. And it's now their time with their ability to manage uh, uh, resources far greater than, than individual provinces. And as I said, all provinces and territories have different abilities to meet their growing needs. But the challenges are the same from coast to coast to coast. So uh, I'm not here to engage, nor will I engage uh, in the months ahead, in a discussion about a debate between public and private. I am a creature of the public system. It was created when I was a kid. It has served me personally, my family, my neighbors, and all British Columbians and Canadians very, very well. So I'm not abandoning that. Quite the contrary. I want to reimagine it uh, for the, the years ahead. And I, and I have uh, 12 other allies and premier's offices across the country. And I believe we have a federal government that's coming around to the need to, to make those serious investments so that we can keep uh, public health care on track. 
follow-up, Andrew? Um, yeah, this is a slightly different topic, but similar theme in, in sort of a, you know, whose responsibilities uh, things are. Uh, there was a fair bit in the speech about housing. Uh, this morning, the NDP MP for uh, Victoria had a press release out complaining that the price of housing in Victoria had doubled since 2015. Uh, I mean, you've been in power here for much of that. You have a 30-point housing plan. Uh, why, why is that particular issue so hard to to get on top of or to, to solve. Why, why is um, housing costs? Well, um, we live on an island. You, you can't just go into the next farmer's field as they do in Mississauga or Brampton or Regina. Uh, you run into water really quickly. So land is at a premium. You've got mountains uh, in the lower mainland. You've got challenges for uh, supply. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, we had to wrestle speculation to the ground. Uh, we've done that, I think, effectively. Uh, the Minister of Finance will have uh, more initiatives coming forward uh, with respect to trying to reduce costs. Uh, but uh, ultimately, we need to build more housing, and we've been building it in record levels. Uh, case in point would be um, student housing. Oftentimes, people say, well, student housing doesn't affect me. I'm not a student. But that takes uh, people, students, out of uh, the marketplace and into the campus, which frees up housing that they would have lived in otherwise. Uh, I, I think we, we just at Thompson Rivers University alone, we built more student housing than the former government built in 16 years. So we're focusing on 30 points, trying to find a way to touch all of the buttons that will lead to more supply, reduce costs, and making sure that people can afford to live in British Columbia. And as we see more people coming here, that will become a bigger challenge, not a smaller one. But uh, certainly I welcome uh, any assistance that we can get from federal members of parliament of all parties. And uh, this, these are challenging issues, but we've uh, uh, made a pretty significant breakthrough in what the, the escalation of costs were from 2012 to 2016. Uh, it's still going up at an unacceptable level, but uh, it'll take uh, consist, consistent work by uh, Minister Eby on the supply side, Minister Robinson on the management side, and uh, again, finding ways to get the federal government back in the housing business, which used to be their responsibility. I'm just going to ask that if you're in the room asking a question, you have to speak up a little so everybody on the phone line can hear. Shannon Waters, BC Today. Hello, Premier. Nice to see you back behind the podium. Um, I wanted to ask about the continuing overdose crisis in BC. We don't have the numbers for the last two months of the year yet, those numbers that are people who died. Um, and it's already the worst year on record. Um, what do you think your government needs to do differently to be able to turn the tide on this crisis? Well, as you know, Shannon, you've been covering this for a long time. It's a multifaceted problem, starting with uh, gangs and those uh, who would prey on vulnerable people uh, for uh, money rather than help. Uh, we need to work with communities on things like safe supply. Uh, uh, the uh, harm reduction strategies that have been in place starting in Vancouver at the turn of the century have been proven to be very effective, not just here, but in, in other jurisdictions. It's still resisted in some communities, but not so much here in British Columbia. Uh, our, getting, making sure there's safe supply is not as easy as snapping your fingers. We've certainly discovered that since uh, uh, 2017, but we'll continue to work on that with communities, with stakeholders. But uh, the, no, I understand that the, um, the coroner will be issuing a report later this week that will be uh, have a, a, a highlighting the devastating impact of the second public health crisis here in British Columbia, the toxic drug supply and its consequences for people and families. Uh, I haven't seen the report. Uh, I expect to be briefed on it uh, in the next number of days. But we have a Minister of Mental Health and Addictions who's working tirelessly to find ways to collaborate with uh, care providers and communities and others uh, on the front lines to make sure that we're doing everything we can to improve outcomes uh, for people who... Uh, who have addictions and uh, challenges with the toxic drug supply. But if it were simple, we would have solved it. Uh, we continue to do our best. And, and as you know, the pandemic has not been our friend in this regard because people are being encouraged to isolate at a time when they need to be surrounded by those who can care for them. And, and so that's a big problem. And we're aware of that. Dr. Henry, of course, uh, was working uh, tirelessly on uh, the opioid crisis before COVID came along. And the public health officials are continuing to do both and uh, they could use a bit of a break as well, but there's no break in sight on the opioid side uh, other than continuing to work with uh, partners in the communities, working with the federal government on things like uh, decriminalization and, and safe supply. But 
those are just some of the tools that we need to have to meet the challenges. And families are constantly calling out to us to do more, and we, we do our best. Uh, uh, Destigmatizing uh, addictions is a key part of that, and I, I'm, I'm quite proud of how the community, not government, but how the community has responded to destigmatizing mental health issues and, and addictions. And, and that, that's all to the good. A better understanding of the challenges helps us bring more allies to the table for, for types of tools that we'll need to finally defeat this. But when we can be together more regularly, where we can have people uh, with friends and loved ones to manage any of the challenges that they may have, I, I we'll get better outcomes. Follow up, Shannon. Yes, the throne speech mentions that the province will continue to press for federal leadership when it comes to decriminalization. Um, and the minister's submission to Health Canada went in, in I believe it was early November. Um, but her mandate letter from 2020 says, in the absence of prompt federal action, she is tasked with working with the public safety minister and attorney general to develop a made in BC solution that will help save lives. So. Do, are you moving away from that made in BC solution? And if not, do you have a timeline for the province going its own way on that issue? Well, we have from 2017, uh, the Solicitor General uh, made it clear that uh, we did not want to see prosecutions uh, from uh, law enforcement uh, going to uh, the prosecutors uh, with respect to simple possession. So that was a made in BC solution. What we want to see from the federal government is uh, relaxing or changing the criminal code, which is their responsibility, which will give more comfort to law enforcement that they're uh, not just following a guideline, but a superintendent in Vancouver uh, uh, coming forward and, and saying, you know, this is where we need to go, uh, the, the uh, chief of police, and, and then uh, chief of police right across the country. And, and I, I expected faster action, quite frankly, from the federal government, but these are not easy issues and, and uh, they always have a season. Uh, we brought forward our, a formal request in, uh, last fall, but that was after collaborating with City of Vancouver and, and others uh, to make sure that the federal government understood that this isn't a Vancouver issue, it's a British Columbia issue. And uh, they were working uh, on, with the view that this was only a, a downtown east side issue and we all know that that's not the case. So first of all, having an understanding in Ottawa, and I believe that that's now well and truly there, that we need a British Columbia focus, and I would suggest a national focus on these issues, and I'm hopeful that that will come. Last question today is from Mira Baines, CBC. Hi, Chris. Um, a lot of businesses, uh, including uh, wedding vendors, are still facing uh, restrictions um, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And they say that it's very difficult for them to access funding. Is there any efforts underway to sort of streamline the process a bit for them? Well, certainly uh, Minister Callon has been working on trying to make sure that our uh, proposals to assist businesses affected by COVID is flexible enough to meet challenges just like this. Uh, as, as luck would have it, uh, my son is getting married this coming uh, summer. He planned to get married last summer. And so I know firsthand the challenges that providers have, uh, and not just you know wedding planners, but all that goes with that uh, in trying to predict where we're going to be. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, that becomes clearer uh, as the summer gets closer, the wedding season, if we stick on this sector. But I know that Minister Callon has been receptive to suggestions and proposals from industry, and we've tried to develop our policies and programs to meet their needs, not as a as a blanket approach, but as a sector specific, specific approach. And one example of that would be uh, legions who are in the business of providing meals, but they're not characterized as uh, restaurants. They're characterized as service clubs that happen to serve food. And so the restrictions on uh, gathering and, and people coming to eat in communal settings had a big impact on them. So we changed our policy to make sure that legions were not left behind. Similarly, uh, gyms uh, were working very closely with us and there's still more work to do there. On the wedding side, I believe that uh, we have been working to find ways to ensure that they, again, they're gonna need human resources, they're gonna need people. And if you don't know where your industry is going to go, it's hard to recruit and retain employees. So these are these are all issues that we're grappling with, and I know Minister Callan seized of it. Do you have a follow-up, Mira? Um, and uh, Mr. Falcon uh, appears eager to get back into the legislature as an MLA. Any idea when a by-election could be called? 
Well, I was happy to see uh, Andrew Wilkinson in the legislature today. I, I was led to believe that he resigned yesterday, so uh, I'm not calling a by-election today. But uh, it, uh, I certainly uh, welcome uh, Minister F Men Member Falcon or, or Citizen Falcon uh, to the leadership of the BC Liberal Party. Uh, I know that he's wanted to do that for a long time, and uh, I welcome him to the fray. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll focus on uh, many of the things that are before us, and one of those would be to fill a vacancy, but there isn't one today, uh, which surprised me. Uh, but uh, I, was, I was happy to see Minister Wilkinson or Member Wilkinson. I hadn't had an opportunity to thank him for his service. I get to do that uh, before he leaves. That's all the time we have. Thanks for joining Great. us. Thanks, everybody.